Yeah, so now we're coming to the best best part of the evening, a talk about purple teaming pen test on steroids by Eliza May Austin. So I've met Eliza now for just 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 over six years as well. When when Eliza studied at Sheffield Hallam University, and Eliza has been a real inspiration to a lot of people. From from university, she's uh, she she's worked in different roles in London as a cybersecurity professional and founded the Ladies in London Hacking Society as well, which has grown to a few which has grown to um, a few branches around the UK, including one in Cheltenham as well. Eliza is also the CEO of that security company as well. And um, and also and also uh, Pocket Pocket CM. So I think I think this talk is going to be really, really fantastic. So everybody, everybody, sit back, sit back, enjoy, and be inspired as well. Eliza, the floor is yours. Take it away. Wow, thank you. I uh, I hope I can live up to that amazing introduction, Andy. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fan around and waste time introducing myself because I think Andy did a, an awesome job there. Um, so thank you for inviting me, uh, everyone. Thanks for having me. I've not been to one of these um, events for a long time. It's about uh, six years ago that I last came to a BCS event and I met Andy at a BCS event. And I think we bonded over cheese, funnily enough, um, on the on the buffet. So uh, yes, and I I vaguely remember um, someone telling me, I'm, I'm really sorry, I forgot the gentleman's name that was speaking earlier. Was it Martin? Martin, yes. So. A uh, very, very vague memory of uh, me raiding the buffet as a student and not being allowed to eat anything. And someone was like, you can't eat that. You're not a BCS member. And Martin said, oh, let her at it. So I remember thinking, oh, I like that guy. So I was very pleased to see Martin on the call today as well. Um, so I'm going to just turn my camera off for the duration of the talk because if I don't, it might um, skew the presentation. I'm not too sure. So can everyone see my presentation screen? Yes, Eliza. OK, fab. OK, so we're just going to be covering what purple teaming is, why you should do it, how you should do it. And, um, and, and hopefully you guys will get some benefit from that. OK. So I just want to apologize in advance. My um, design skills are not amazing. So my uh, my slides are a little bit bare. So um, sorry, <laughs> sorry in advance. So in order to break down what purple teaming is, I sort of need to go into um, the constituents of purple teaming. And I don't want to tell anyone how to suck eggs. You're all incredibly intelligent people and you have a lot of you have got way more experience than I've got, but I just feel like it's necessary for those that don't know much about purple teaming. So to start off with, it, I suppose it's beneficial to explain um, where that name comes from. So it comes from um, the difference between red and blue teams and how they can merge together and create something special in cyber defense. So um, you'll all have come across penetration testing um, and that very much aligns to a small scope. Um, and that can be anything from a particular web application pen test um, down to a subnet um, or a VLAN, whatever. Um, and it's very much a legally agreed compromise and it's defined, defined by a scope. Um, red teaming, on the other hand, is set to achieve a specific goal um, and usually it's to emulate a realistic attack. So um, we want to see how people would attack our network or we want to see how people would attack our um, um, web application. So let's get a red team involved and just see what happens. So 
currently there's a bit of a problem when it comes to red teaming and penetration tests. And that problem, I'm sure a lot of you would have come across this um, working in various different areas of IT. Um, and that problem is that they will do a great job and they'll, a lot of the time, they'll get into various aspects of the network or application and make it do things it shouldn't do. But then when it comes to the report, that report may be quite vague. And on the remediation and mitigation side, the, the bit that's actually important to the company, it's quite hard to decipher what you need to do off the back of um, that red team exercise or that penetration test. So that's where purple team comes in. So with blue teams, again, there's, there's also a problem there. So a lot of the time, the blue teams are, in, you know, obviously and inherently concerned with defense. So they focus on remediation and mitigation, but they're not looking at the attack methodology. Um, so how they then isolate and eradicate an attacker becomes quite difficult because they have to understand that methodology in order to do that quickly and efficiently. A lot of the time they can't. And a lot of the reason is because they're so reliant on tools. So I've worked on the blue side um, for years now. And every time I've ever been for a job interview before starting the company that I started, I was always asked, what's your proficiency with Splunk? What's your proficiency with QRadar? Or if they're using ArcSight, what's your proficiency with ArcSight? And if I've not used that tool, my response has always been, does it really matter? If I understand the concepts of what a SIEM is, a security incident and event management solution, if I understand what that is, if I understand the premise of log aggregation, um, the purpose of it is for cyber defense and seeing attacker activity, being eyes and ears on the network, does it actually matter if I've used that particular interface? You can train a monkey to use a particular interface, but understanding why they're using it that's that's the bigger issue and a, a lot of the time um blue teamers and i'm ge genuinely not getting at blue teamers here because i've i've been one um their reliance is on tools and it's on tools that they are allowed to use and i think that's quite important and that's something that we'll probably come back to in a little bit so you also find that blue teams are quite under resourced as well um so, sorry, again, as I said, these slides are really basic. So I'm talking loads, but there's really not much on this slide and I do apologize for that. Um, so often um, a blue team might have a couple of people or one if a company has a certain degree of maturity that's dedicated to security. But on the other side, you've also got infrastructure personnel and sysadmins and people that work in IT on a general level or um, I think I think you I think you muted Eliza. You've muted yourself. Yeah, we can't hear the speaker. Oh my God, are you serious? How long have I been muted? A minute or oh, two. Yeah, only a minute of two. Oh shit! So, did you go? <laughs> I'm really sorry. Did you guys hear everything on this slide? Up to allowed tools. Oh, balls. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. So basically what I was getting at, although I have no idea how I viewed myself, I'm sorry, guys. Um, so what I'm getting at here is um, blue teamers, a lot of the time they're overworked, they're expected to use um, company agreed tools. So what's on the allowed list, what's on the suppliers list, and they're not allowed to deviate from that. Whereas red teamers are, and they can use custom scripts and various other things, blue teamers can't. Um, so a purple team is very much a collaborative approach to bring in those two sides together. Um, 
So we want the benefit of red teamers to be able to use any wide scope and we want to understand how blue teamers find that and defend against it using the tools that they're allowed to use. OK, so um, yeah, really sort of basic common sense approach to cyber defense. So I think the main thing to um, remember for penetration testers is that they need to remain open and not have a closed book on this. So um, if any of you have been involved in red teaming, but from a defense perspective, you'll, re you'll understand what I'm saying about closed and open book. Um, so a lot of the time red teaming is um, quite hidden. You're not always told about it. It's partially used as a test to see how the staff on the defense side handle it. So I think it's quite an interesting change in that dynamic. Okay, so... Um, Something that I think is really important to mention is you could purple team um, a website penetration test if you wanted to. You could um, have an open forum where you have a blue teamer involved in the penetration testing of a website or a mobile application. And that would be great. And you'd get to the bottom of what's wrong with it and how to remediate it vastly quicker than if you just had um, a red teamer on it on their own. However, when it comes to a purple team engagement, and I'm talking about the full environment. So that's um, the entire infrastructure. What is important to realize is that adversely emulation purple teaming is the way to go forward. And adversary emulation is literally what it says on the tin. So it's using threat intelligence gathered in the information gathering phase, and we'll go into phases in a minute, and you're directly replicating a adversary that's applicable to that um, customer or to um, that environment. So we want to concern ourselves with the most likely adversaries and um, align it to that adversaries attack methodology. So there's no point penetration testing um, an environment based on a completely different company. So for example, the threat landscape of a manufacturer that manufactures medications is going to be vastly different to that of an e-commerce retailer that doesn't actually manufacture anything themselves. So they're, um, the attackers that they need to align their defences to are going to be vastly different. So I suppose um, one of the arguments against that process is um, people that will argue, well, we you know, there isn't an exploit for X, Y, Z, or um, a lot of cloud computing is quite secure. So, you know, we don't need to concentrate on that. Well, forget all of that. We need to think of the vulnerabilities we don't know about yet. Vulnerabilities come out every day. There's going to be something next year and there's going to be something next, you know, 10 years from now. And we need to try and harden our infrastructure as best we can against the methodologies of our attackers for the future. So this, hopefully this is quite clear on the screen. So this is um, a methodology that we at that security company designed ourselves. Um, and personally, I think it follows a very common sense approach. I don't think it's, although it's our intellectual property, I don't think it's anything off the charts genius. It's just really common sense. And personally, if I ran a company that needed a penetration tester to come in, I would expect them to do this anyway but they don't, and that's kind of the problem. So we'll go into these things in a little bit more detail going forward, but we always want to start off with threat intelligence and information gathering. Um, and that's, you know, from an adversary perspective against the company, and then from an adversary perspective, on the adversary, apologies, um, on the adversary themselves as well. We want to build everything we find out about them, the way that they work into a playbook. And we would then want to use that playbook into our penetration test. Now, you'll see in purple team exercise round one, there's a little red square because that I just wanted to highlight to you where red team in lies and purple team, in, not purple team, red team in and penetration testing lies within this entire purple team cycle. So. You do have penetration testing, but it exists 
in a little piece of the entire process. So unlike um, a general penetration test with a purple team in, you would do your penetration testing and you would then remediate the findings and you'd then reiterate what you'd done from an offensive perspective to prove that you'd fixed those vulnerabilities and then you'd present that and you, you finished and you'd put that in a report. So a lot of what happens is um, if you imagine, um, I don't know, you have Bob and Alice, let's use Bob and Alice because why not? Um, Bob's our penetration testament, Alice is our cyber defender. I might say to Bob, turn to page six, go to section B. I want you to run that command against this machine in this way. So Bob will go ahead and do that. And I'll then turn to Alice and say, Alice, can you see that? And Alice will say, yes. I'll say, great. Can you do anything about it? No. OK, so I've identified a blind spot there. We need to go and put something into the environment that enables Alice to do something about that particular attack in that particular phase of the attack process. On another, on another hand, I might say to the penetration tester, OK, I want you to turn to this part of the, the playbook can you successfully do this? No, I can't escalate my privileges. Okay, so we've identified a successful mitigation there. So the defense side, you know, they're doing something right. And again, that can go in the report as well. Um, or maybe there's actually a blind spot and not only can they not do something about it, they actually can't see it. And that's something else that we've identified as well. And another thing I want to note is this is, incredibly uh, lateral movement orientated. So we assume compromise and we don't care so much about the attack vector. Whereas in a red team, you would care about the attack vector. And in fact, a lot of the activity of a red team may surround the attack vector, as in you might do a phishing exercise um, or you may um, work with a USB or just try di different malware exploits. Whereas with this, what we're doing is we're assuming that that attacker, that advanced attacker in a lot of cases, has got into the network successfully. What would they do once they're in the network? That's what we want to define our um, defense processes around. OK, so um, the threat intelligence phase. So I just want to go back to this again. We're starting off with threat intelligence. So a way that you guys can do this um, really easily, if you want to try this in the companies where you work, is to go to the attack navigator. Now, I'm just going to pretend that um, we're looking at a manufacturing company right now. So I know just from previously reading about it, the APT20, uh, APT18 sorry, targets manufacturing. So I'll go through the attack navigator and I'll just highlight all the um, TTPs that this particular adversary uses. So I could Google around a little bit and just find out who targets manufacturing. But for now, let's say I'm just concentrating on APT28 because they're really known for targeting manufacturing. Right. So let's say that I'm manufacturing, but I'm also in the oil and gas industry. So I know, again, um, from previously looking at it, that uh, a group called Muddy Water, I think they're called Muddy Water, let's just check, shall we? Yeah, Muddy Water. They also like to attack oil and gas. So this particular customer, or company rather, has um, a threat landscape that should be aware of all these things highlighted in red. So I can then just take that off into a spreadsheet um and i can just work my way through that in particular i'll just not that you need to see this but oh my spreadsheet's dead but okay never mind so we can ignore well not ignore but we can prioritize the areas that are actually of concern to us and our environment so the great thing about this as well is it's got initial access execution persistence so we can see how our most likely attackers use persistence in our environment. So we're not wasting our time on different things that are, don't actually apply to our environment. <laughs> Excuse me. 
Um, so, I mean, this, for example, collection. So when they're actually trying to exfiltrate data out of your environment, what in what way are they taking that data before they exfiltrate it? Well, in this area, a lot of the time it's screen captures. So that just makes your life so much simpler. You can concentrate on um, removing that capability from the systems that are there. So I just wanted to quickly go through that. You can actually, I mean, you can play around with that. It's a great tool and it's free as well. So. <clears throat> okay, so when we, um, again, the next phase, when, when we get to the next phase after we've done our threat intelligence gathering and, and information on our attackers and on ourselves. So um, when I talk about information gathering, I'm talking literally looking at the CISO online, looking at the CEO, if they've been involved in any scandals, has the company been involved in any scandals? I remember previously um, working at a, a retail company and they were great, by the way, really nice company. Um, but they had this one face cream that they were selling and one ingredient in the face cream was tested on animals. They therefore became a huge target by um, hacktivists that were all about um, animal cruelty and being against, um, you know, uh, using animals in testing and veganism and all this stuff. So it's actually incredibly important to, to do that threat intelligence aspect of, of your design. So I use the word design there, I use that for a reason. So you have to then design how you're going to emulate that attacker rather than just, um, you know, punching thin air in the dark. You have to actually look at what they've done and do, does that apply to your environment? Can you align it to your environment? And you need to be specific, specific, Christ, specific. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, you need to be specific. So as you can see here on the right hand side of the screen, um, there's actual commands and there's actual um, file addresses. So we can see exactly where we're expecting to find something um, before we go into it. I mean, obviously these things can change and like any attacker that gets into an environment, if there's some low hanging fruit, they may go for that. On the other hand, some attackers, especially nation states, they aim for a particular um, thing, a, a crown jewel, so to speak, and nothing, no low hanging fruit, fruit will stop them from getting to that or aiming for that um, to the point where they may leave low hanging fruit just hanging. So there's various different aspects of behavior that you have to take into account as well. So once that, um, once that playbook has been um, created and has been run with on, open, on an open book format, so everyone has access to this book, um, Blue Team and Red Team, you can then keep it and just rerun it every year if you wanted to and just see how much uh, more you improve every year. So there's that, it's pretty interesting. So um, going back to the, the little diagram I spoke to you about earlier, um, we have round one and round two penetration testing. So this is round one. And I cannot stress enough how much you have to keep track of what you're doing um, to get the maximum amount of benefit from it. Um, so this is the way that I would advise you to keep track if you're just getting started. So this is from um, this is from a purple team engagement that I've previously done um, with our company. Uh, it was very successful. Um, so you can see in this first column, we've got the adversary. So we're making a note of which adversary uses this methodology that we're just about to do. Excuse me while I just take a drink. So you can see in the top box, we've got FIN6 and APT10. So FIN6 is a financial attacker um, and APT is an advanced persistent threat attacker. And we can see that a particular method that they're known for using is PSExec. They're, they're used to use utilizing um, the functionality of PSXX for malicious purposes. Um, were we able to compromise the machine using that? Yes, we were. You can see here. Yes, we were. Um, was it detected? It actually was. Um, and it was detected by an endpoint agent and it was alerted, but it wasn't removed and an analyst didn't detect it. 
So you can imagine what the remediation was here. I've blurred it out because um, some of them have sensitive information in or they have names in um, of particular, particular users. So the, remedi the remediation on, on this one was to um, just do some education around PS exec and its functionality and basically take it off the machines that it weren't needed on. Um, also, it's really interesting. It's really interesting to note um, a use case for this, which I'm going to come to in a minute. Actually, but I just want you to bear in mind: don't ask yourself if you are hackable, but just ask yourself if you can detect and respond to being attacked, and that's what this spreadsheet is all about. Okay, so um, after we've done the penetration testing and we've identified all of these problems that are in red um we then want to be thinking about remediation and mitigation so ideally we'd be doing this alongside so um one of the benefits of purple teaming is that while you're identifying these problems you can be putting in the changes in place in order to rectify them now the one thing that I would advise for anyone attempting to do purple teaming internally at the company that you're at is to get change control on side. Now, unfortunately, the biggest bugbear in um, purple teaming is change control and the bureaucracy that can come along with it. However, when um, we do an investigation um, ourselves, um, what we do is as soon as we, sorry, not an investigation, um, an engagement sorry ourselves is um one of the first things we do is we we get a meeting with change control and we discuss um the prioritization and the quick um turnaround of changes that come off the back of the the testing phase and we work with them to identify the ones that are critical and the ones that aren't and obviously the ones that aren't critical we wouldn't expect um change control to, get, to go ahead and to implement them so um, basically with remediation and mitigation, I think it's just good to note that um, defense in depth isn't about buying loads of tools and just hoping that they do what they say they do. It's about looking at your environment from different levels and applying security to those different levels. For example, um, the cyber kill chain, that's a super simple way of looking at your environment in this way. And, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, but just for now, I, I wanna show you um, what the remediation side looks like from a data perspective. So once you've uh, captured all this information, you can then start working on it. So as you can see from the key at the top, anything in blue is um, fixed or does not need any action or was successful in terms of defense and anything purple is in progress. So you can really identify ways that you can kick off actual meaningful um, um, projects, defense projects here as well. So I want to just go back to what I was talking about, about defense in depth and looking at different areas where um, you've been exploited. And I want to use the cyber kill chain for that. And Lockheed Martin created it and it's absolutely fantastic. And game changing from a defense perspective, if you apply this to how you think while you're um, looking at an attack happening, because you can really hone in on certain specific areas. So the further down this um, attack chain you get, the further towards the red, the harder it is to come back from. The more likely it is that you have to wipe a machine, for example, or isolate something, um, or even rebuild your Active Directory forest. I, that's how serious it is the more that you can apply defense measures further up towards the green the better position you're in so you really want to be thinking um about the phases of attack while you're doing purple teaming so reconnaissance okay if we're not looking at the attack vector it doesn't matter so much from an external point of view say reconnaissance on your website but if you see scanning internally from one machine to another, I mean, that's something you want to isolate, right? Um, so weaponization, 
weaponizing a, a piece of uh, benign code into something malicious, if there's a way that you can identify that happening on your network, you want to be hitting it there. You want to be um, seeing if, you know, PowerShell, for example, is um, doing something it shouldn't do or doing something it doesn't normally do from a system it doesn't normally do it from a user who doesn't normally do it. Delivery. You know, where is this activity happening? Where Where is it coming from and where is it going? An exploitation. Um, we really want to be looking from a defense perspective of how we're exploitable, okay? And where can we deploy our fences to understand how we're no longer exploitable and where success is and what success looks like for us. So there's all these different um, kinds of areas where we can concentrate in purple teaming and it's really good to keep track of those things. So um, I think one of the key benefits of doing a purple team over doing a simple pen test, I mean, there's always, there's always room for be doing penetration testing and you don't always need to do purple theming, to be completely honest. If you're in an immature environment in terms of their cybersecurity, then don't waste your time on purple theming because you're not going to get much benefit from it. Like if you don't have a seam, for example, and you don't have no visibility, there's very little you can do in terms of identifying at which stage an attack is happening and where your weaknesses are and how you can improve which stage. Right. So um, you need to have evidence based defense. And the way to do that is to have visibility. So you can see here, this is the same um, section of this attack that we've done. Um, so we've tried out PS exec, we've tried out um, WMI, and we've tried out RDP on certain machines that shouldn't have had that enabled. Um, and that's failed. And then you can see here on this purple um, sheet where we've kicked off remediation project work. So just keeping track is really important. We can we can be told we're secure, we can buy the right tool and we can employ the right person and follow the right process. But unless it's evidence based, we can't just assume that we're not vulnerable. OK, so um, this is although it's a pretty picture, it's also slightly more than a pretty picture. Just going to have a drink. I hope I'm not on mute. Christ. Um, so when you've done all of that fancy work and you've correlated everything that you've got into a nice big report that might be 40 pages long or something ridiculous. Another problem that we face in InfoSec is that we're not always speaking the business language. We're not always... Um, highlighting the benefits to the board in the way that they can actually interpret it into a successful project. Um, and a way to do that is to consolidate it. So this is an example poster of a way that we've consolidated everything that we've done on a penetrate on sorry on a purple team exercise. And we've put it in a way that is just you can glance at it, you can see the high level information and also if the analysts want to print this out and stick it on their wall because they think it's cool, they can. Um, so there's some really cheesy things in here, like we've catted out uh, why we did this purple teaming. So what the company hoped to gain from it, um, the methodology used, what was successful, what we were able to penetrate, how we remediated it, and ongoing plans. So all these kinds of things, really, really handy. So um, if you plan on doing something like this internally and you don't have a purple theme function at the moment, I think one of the major things to concentrate, because company politics is a thing, one of the major things to concentrate on is um, how you interpret success to people that don't understand um, the technological aspects of what you're doing. So some general benefits of purple teaming. So Purple teaming can bring about all the benefits of a penetration test and more. So um, you get gap analysis, training. I cannot emphasize enough how amazing the training is out of a purple team engagement. So for example, um, 
a someone that does red teaming and penetration testing every day they get to understand how their internal defenders find them right and your internal defenders get to understand how their systems are exploited and the benefit of that is that both teams have no choice then but to upskill so they have to improve at what they're doing so you inevitably end up with a more mature security environment um visibility is optimized so for example like i was saying previously when i was showing you um the the vulnerability spread spreadsheet if there's something that's missing if i've said to alice can you see what bob is doing and she says no then we know that there's a visibility flaw there and we can go and we can write a use case or write a rule put that in place and rerun the attack and make sure that it's worked and that's all done in a matter of weeks so um you can Q&A, so quality assure your pre-existing security. So all that stuff that you've spent your money on, you're making sure that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, okay? So you're baking in detection along that attack path. So that attack path that you've identified, all those multiple attack paths that you've identified from that threat intelligence work that you put effort into, you're actually now knowing that you're defended against your most likely adversaries. And off the back of that, you're applying tactical fixes to real time and real world attacks, not just what's in fashion, not just what's in the news, not just what you think that you should be defending against. You're defending against what's applicable to you. And you're also able to evaluate the defense strategy that you have to determine whether or not it's working. Is what you are doing, what you think that you're doing, right is it right or is it wrong or is there something that needs to change is there a different direction that you need to go in it can all be identified with this um you can measure the the coverage of the tools that you've got um and you can measure the visibility of the infrastructure that you've got you're preemptively defending against things that may happen in the future um and you also something that's really important is you're improving communication among your teams so I'm sure a lot of you are already aware of how divisive it is between red team and blue team. And how a lot of the time red teamers think that their job's harder and blue teamers think, no, our job's harder. And there's arguments around the fact that red teamers, they constantly have to be doing security research to keep up to date. And then they have to target various things and have to keep within a scope. And but on the blue teamer side, They've got projects they're working on. They've got BAU, they've got detect and respond. And now you're throwing a red team exercise at us. And we know that it's you, so we're not going to prioritize it. What if it's a smoke screen? There's all these different things. And then on the flip side, there's also budget optimization. So this is something you can really communicate the, um, the benefit to, to the business. You can identify um, where things are lax and where things can be improved. And that can give you a real insight to where your budget to spend is. So also, I just want to say you don't always need purple teaming. It's not always the best approach. So if you're working in a company that's particularly small and not very security mature, I, I would not um, advise doing purple teaming. It may end up being a waste of time. Um, a, a pen test may be best for a small piece of work. And if you've got absolutely no visibility whatsoever, I think that's your main priority. Um, you don't want to be doing purple teaming if you can't see the actions of um, the offensive security side. So there's a number of different use cases um, of where and sorry of how you would want to use purple teaming, why you would want to use it. But a lot of the time um, people use it because it not only satisfies a pen test requirement that they have, um, they may be trying to get a certification, for example, and it requires that they have a penetration test. This all this satisfies that. But it also tests their resiliency against likely adversaries. It upscales, upskills and matures their existing personnel um, and it enables them to refine their budgetary spend. So there's a lot of different use cases and some companies use them um, in a silo and others use them quite holistically. So that's quite interesting to see um, the different benefits. So I just want to go into budget optimization. Um, because this is something that's been um, really important during COVID, for example. Um, I'm sure some of you know that there's a lot of companies out there that have furloughed their entire security team. 
and you think, why? <laughs> In a time like this, why? However, they have. Um, and there's a lot of slimlining going on and I can understand it and it is what it is. However, um, a way to use this for the time that we're in right now is to use it for budget optimization. So I just want to tell you about um, sort of a case study, so to speak, of a, a customer that I previously had and a company that I previously worked on. Um, they were great. They were a huge international company and they'd spent like £100,000 on um, EDR, on an EDR solution, detect and respond solution. They'd spent maybe double that on antivirus, um, like loads, okay? And none of those things detected anything that we did, anything. However, every time we tried to download something, any time we tried to execute something, any time we even tried to execute custom scripts, so some, not every custom script, but sometimes if you get the source code of a piece of malware or a hacking tool and you change it, you then changing the hash of that tool so it no longer is identified in an antivirus product. Um, Windows Defender actually picked up almost all of these things. And Windows Defender has got a terrible name. I don't work for Windows Defender. I don't get money from them. I don't even use Windows. I'm at 100%. Linux girl um, but I will say that Windows Defender on this particular engagement was amazing now the catch is that company did not even know where they had it they'd set up a load of um, Windows machines throughout their organization and they'd not fully checked what was on it so Windows Defender was there it was operational by default um, and it was defending them where their expensive EDR and their expensive AV was not. So their entire saving grace throughout the entire lateral movement process was Windows Defender and they didn't know. So they could have saved £100,000 on EDR and maybe a quarter of a million or something absolutely ridiculous on their AV and just used their native functionality in a Windows environment. So there was a lot of money spent there on the wrong stuff, and there tends to be that tends to be a trend in cybersecurity, um, and that stems from a lack of understanding on who your adversaries are, and what your threat landscape is. So something like this allows you to focus your budget on areas that apply to you, and I think that's the most important key thing to take away. So you can identify. Um, things that you need to change in the people that you have. Maybe it's training. Maybe, you, maybe you're trying to cut back and there's people that you need to fire, but you don't know who to pick and you need someone to come in and say, OK, um, you know, Bob and Alice are great, but Jeff's a bit shit. So let's get rid of Jeff. They need someone to come in and say that. OK, you need someone to come in and refine your processes. OK, and you need someone to tell you what technologies you're wasting money on and which ones you're underutilizing. You can do that yourself. You do not need people to come in and tell you how to do it. You can implement a purple team functionality and you can do that yourself. OK. Um, so just some considerations if you guys do decide to go away and do this. Um, cultural issues between red and blue. So um, like I mentioned before, um, there's a lot of rivalry there. And if you remember maybe three, four years ago, um, loads of companies were jumping on the bandwagon of um, gamification of security. So internally, they were gamifying um, the cultural rivalry, rivalry between red and blue. So, you know, um, red got points for exploiting and blue got point for, points for defending. And it's awesome and it sounds great and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work. It doesn't. I'm sorry, but it doesn't work. I've worked in an environment that did that. Although in some aspects it was fun. Uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story about... Um, how um, the red team in a company that I worked at actually found some quite dangerous vulnerabilities um, on internet facing on an internet facing system, and um, rather than tell us about it so that we could fix it, they kept it a secret so that they could exploit it later and um, and cash in the points so that they could get vouchers, which is absolutely insane. Both working for the same team at the end of the day, and um, your priority should be to defend the infrastructure. But gamification doesn't align with that. In fact, it's quite contradictory. 
So um, another consideration to take into um, to, another thing to take into consideration rather is um, the blue team workload. So anyone that's here that works in a blue team, you'll know that you'll be uh, working on projects, you'll be going to meetings, you might even be on tra the change control committee, um, you'll be doing detect and respond, you might be writing use cases, you might also be managing the SIEM tools. You might also be doing um, training and awareness, there's loads of different things that you might be doing. And this is just another thing that's thrown at you. Okay, so if you're in a management position in a company and, and you're listening now, I think that's one of the main things that you really need to hone in on, resourcing. Can, do we have the resources to, to do this? Do we have the budget to bring someone in if we don't have the resources? Bureaucracy, another thing, massive, massive problem. Um, you know, bureaucracy and change control, bureaucracy in having the ability to um, pen test certain areas and to take resources out of a team in order to do this. So again, that's another thing. Um, and then the frequency, frequency and when you're going to do it. So in terms of when, absolutely don't do this near Christmas because you are most likely going to have a change freeze. So, you know, you might want to think about doing this after Christmas. Frequency, are you going to do this once and see how you get on? and maybe implement it yourself going forward off the back of what you've learned. I mean, I think that's a really good way of doing it. Or um, are you are you going to do it yearly? Or are you going to try and rather than make an engagement, are you going to try and make it a way of working so that every time you have a pen test, you have some element of defense involved? I think that's also a good way of doing it. it just depends on what your business goals are. And I think that takes us on to the last point. So the objective of the business, what's the point? What's the point for you? What are you hoping to gain from this? Are you hoping to be more secure? Are you hoping to be more mature? Um, I didn't mean to rhyme then, by the way. <laughs> I'm not naturally a poet. So here's just um, some points on how to purple team on a zero budget. I just want to take a sip. So I know like a lot of companies right now, their budgets have been obliterated. Um, and a lot of that has been because um, companies have put that same budget into um, uh, business continuity, for example, um, and, and managing the process of COVID-19. So I think it's really good to share how to just get started with this without paying for it. So I would advise any of you uh, that wants to explore purple teaming and explore a more um, mutually beneficial way of working between red and blue is to go ahead and use that mitre attack framework um, that I briefly showed you guys earlier. And I can share a link into the, the chat if you want later. So just identify your most likely adversaries and their TTPs. Um, so by TTPs, I mean tactics, techniques and procedures. So just the way that they work. Um, so you can literally go onto the Mitre Attack website and just type in um, retail, for example, um, or type in a particular malware family that you might be seeing a lot of. You can get a wealth of information on that and you can apply that to, to your environment. So um, I would advise you to collaborate on a, a scoping of a straightforward pen test. So rather than jumping into like something huge and I'm making a huge deal out of this. I would say if you're in a company and they're doing a like a, a monthly or bi-monthly penetration test of their website, um, I'd, I'd probably advise you to just get uh, a defender involved in that and and just work together on it and be really open and be in the same room. And I think it's worth noting that if you have an application, a piece of code, and you make an alteration on that application, it can massively alter the way that application works, the functionality of it entirely. It can make the entire thing vulnerable from simple changes. And the the easiest way to think about um, vulnerabilities in a network environment is to apply that same thought process. So if you stand up a new machine, what accommodations have you had to make on the network in order to stand that machine up? Now, what, com what potential ways of compromisation is that brought in? What vulnerabilities is that brought in? So when you make massive changes or after a, a heavy change period or a merge and acquisition, consider doing a penetration, a penetration test through a purple teaming methodology. 
and see what comes out at the end of it. And I guarantee you will learn a lot more than you would learn from doing a standard red team or penetration test exercise. So again, make sure that you are exchanging information between teams. Communication during testing is amazing. If you can't communicate in person because of the current times, you can use Slack or Teams or whatever. Um, I've done a purple team engagement and we predominantly use Slack and Google Hangouts and it worked fantastically. Um, keep track of the results. So always, always, always record what you're doing. You can't learn from it if you don't keep a record of it. And if you leave that company, you want to know that the person that comes in and fills your shoes knows what to do the next time. Show value in collaboration. So if you're doing this for the first time and you're doing it on a zero budget, if you can show how this has benefited the business, how this has potentially saved money on bringing in external people, um, you massively get the CISO and the head of IT on board, um, no problem. So um, don't be over ambitious, have a go at it, have fun, see if it works, and always remember to ask questions because you're not gonna learn anything from either side if you don't ask questions. And I think a huge problem in information security is whether you're an, F whether you're an offensive security um, practitioner or a defensive practitioner, there's a big stigma around not knowing something. And unfortunately, that breeds into the culture. So I think having an open forum to ask questions is incredibly important. Um, so I'm just about finished. So um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. I understand I've literally just spoke at you for a good hour. <laughs> so um, feel free to ask away if you have anything to ask. So, uh, yeah, so thank you, Eliza. That was a fantastic talk. So everybody, um, everybody, if you've got any questions, um, would, uh, you could, would you like to, um, we've, we've got a chat here as well. So um, would anybody like to ask some questions personally or shall I just read them from group, group, uh, group chat? I don't mind. Okie dokie, so. So got so got one from oh sorry oh, it's back on back on there so I'll I'll yeah so uh, so um, you've got you've got a few questions uh, Eliza so you've got one from Kim Kimberly um, how long does this all usually take from threat intel to handling over a plan to the CISO. And have you ever done a purple team in engagement where something went wrong? Okay, really good questions, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, so it would normally take about three weeks. Um, so that's from the initial threat intelligence and scoping all the way to the finalization of it and getting that in front of the CISO and sort of showing the benefits. It would, we would expect it to take about three weeks. Um, and I think that's enough time, really. I think you don't want to be you don't want to be faffing around with people in your environment any longer than that. Um, yes, I have had ones that have gone incredibly wrong. So the one I mentioned where we had um, done it during COVID, so there was a lot of activity on Slack and on Google Hangouts. Um, we had some people on the company side that were just really quiet. And it was really weird. So um, they had no enthusiasm to get involved. So on the days that they were working, it was incredibly hard to get any feedback. So you'd be like, okay, can you see this? And they'd be like, I don't know. So <laughs> that was really hard. <laughs> Whereas if you were in the same room as them, you'd be able to be like, mm. um, but also luckily I had access so I could see their seam solution. And I could see what was coming through and what wasn't. And, and we could apply um, use cases and rule sets to, to that. Um, but yeah, it really, um, the atmosphere was really bad. I think that was one of the hardest things. Um, and I think one of the hardest things in general is getting people on board with it because they can, a lot of the time people will think, oh, fuck, I've got enough to do. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I working with this third party on this? Um, but then on the flip side, we get um, some analysts that are just like super psyched to do it because it's really exciting piece of work. Good question. Thanks, Kimberly. The next I don't question... want to stop sharing my screen, by the way. Sorry. 
Um, you, you, you start sharing your screen now, anyway. Oh, have I? Yeah, 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 yeah. You stop. You, you, you've stopped sharing your screen already. Oh, thank you. Had I stopped sharing it while I was doing my talk? Um, well, you shared the screen throughout throughout my talk, anyway. But uh, you stopped sharing it after the Q and A um, slide slide appeared. That's okay. The next question is from Graham. So he's actually got uh, three questions for you. So first question. Oh, great. Is, Thanks, Graham. Yeah. How would you advise a vulnerable client to defend against social engineering tax? And can people teaming help for this? So that's question number one. Can I answer that first? Otherwise, I'll forget. Of course. Yeah. So um, social engineering attacks, a massive problem that has been going on for about three or four years now is um, attackers, crim organized criminal gangs, scraping things like LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook for identifiable information. Um, so for example, you can, if someone's got their profile open, you can type in, I don't know, Sheffield Hallam University and see everyone that works there. You could type, you could um, cross-reference that with um, lecturer and see who's a lecturer there and all these different things. And then you could use something like, um, well, if they've got their email address on there, easy but you could also use something like i think it's hunter.io where you could type in sheffield hallam university and they'll give you the syntax for their email address um so i think a massively beneficial thing to do is to just encourage the employees that you have to lock down their social media accounts so that's one um and because that is a lot of the time where it starts before it even gets to your environment um and another thing is I know it sounds boring, but training an awareness around email hygiene. So a lot of the time, um, social engineering is done via email. So um, having regular tests where you have your internal team just send out um, a crafted email that's like, okay, invoice 7960Z or whatever. Um, from the CEO, can you just hurry up and pay this, please? This person's been waiting a long time, like really pissy like that. And see if anyone pays it, like or tries attempts to pay it. If you have a seam solution in place, um, you'd be able to see the activity of um, that person's communication with um, a, an IP address, for example, or um, visiting a domain. So you'd be able to see who and which hosts have, have gone to it and which ones haven't and keep track of that over time. And I think that's that's a really beneficial way of combating social engineering. But at the end of the day, humans are humans and we all make mistakes. But I'm quite harsh. If someone repeatedly went against what I trained them on, on social engineering, I'd probably just fire them in the end. Second question is, uh, is it possible to automate attack pattern recognition so that Reconnaissance is detected when you can predict the next likely event or target, and can it help blue and red teams work together? Yeah, I think it can. I think that's a really good question. Um, so it really depends on the environment. So from an external perspective first, um, let's say that you are an e-commerce site, well, you were, you were a retail company or you worked in sales or whatever. Um, or you had an offer on November to December, uh, you might anticipate a lot more activity because it's leading up to Christmas. Um, there's a, going to be a lot more activity on your site and B, there's always more cyber attacks during that time. Um, so you can pre-program that into the rule sets that you've got, um, like even a Boolean algorithm saying, okay, um, you know, if X and Y happens, do Z, except for in November and December, but internally, um, I mean, it's quite difficult. It just depends on on the business that you are. But um, yeah, yeah, I suppose you could. If you uh, worked in a manufacturing environment, for example, um, there's no reason why you couldn't um, program an alert into your Steam solution, for example, um, that says if, you know, if a particular section of, um, your network has been shut down, alert on these things you wouldn't normally alert on. I mean, I'm not sure, but I mean, yeah, there is ways to automate it. 
but also anything you come across that's human detectable you need to be automating that um so what i mean by that is if something didn't show up in a scene for example during a purple team exercise but like barry from barry this cis admin saw there's some odd behavior on a particular server um why aren't you taking knowledge from Barry and implementing that into a use case and deploying that use case into a rule set within your Steam solution? There is, you absolutely need to be doing that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, but it, it really depends on, on what stage and what piece of attack it is and, and how, how you're going to automate that. Thank you. The next question is, bureaucracy and resources are difficult to get around. What is the best argument for an SME to perform their security changes? Oh, good question. So um, I often think SMEs have it a bit easier. It's like the big enterprises that are really crap with this or government bodies, terrible. Um, with SMEs, I mean, the SMEs that I've worked in, I don't... I, is it Graham that asked this question? Yes. Um, I don't know where you work, but the SMEs that I've I've come across, it's very much been about having an actual discussion and explaining what you want to do, how you want to do it, what the benefits are. Not an email, a discussion. Um, and I find that bureaucracy often is created on both ends. So a lot of the time you've got... Um, a, a company that's growing and they put middle managers in and they put managers to manage those middle managers in and it creates all this communication and everyone's just like oh who do I talk to and it creates this bureaucracy and the, these channels that you have to go through but on the other hand you've got people on the ground that think oh, I can't just message the CISO or the CTO I've got to go through my manager or I've got to go through my team lead and my team lead will get no fuck all of that just go to the person that controls the decision um and if they don't like it they don't like it it's, the end, it's not the end of the world is it um so i would say the the way around bureaucracy is to not entirely follow the demands of the people that enforce the bureaucracy that might be a controversial point to make but um that's never harmed me i i implemented um, a purple team function at a large financial institution and it was very bureaucratic it was ridiculous um and that was simply through taking um the head of pen testing out for a coffee and um just getting his agreement on it and uh we both realized that we had an interest in in each other's line of work and decided that we could create a function that would um employ that interest into in, into the defense mechanisms of the business so you can change process that way i hope that answered your question graham i'm sorry if it didn't yes that was most helpful thank you uh -huh. got some questions got um, a few questions from brandon as well so i like that name it's a nice name so first one is, what different approaches have you used to deal with a man in the middle attack? Um, I suppose that it depends what it is. I mean, it depends what it's in the middle of. Um, but at the same time, this isn't, purple teaming isn't about specific attacks. It's attacks that apply to the environment. Um, but you can get around man in the middle attacks predominantly through encryption um, and through securing the data in transit. And that's, that's the main thing. And also rogue, de rogue device detection. So um, if you're in an environment and you think that there may be some man in the middle attacks going on, have a look for rogue devices and make sure that your encryption's um, standard. You've got a good encryption at standard across the environment. But um, that, unless it's something that um, a specific attacker, attacker would do against a company, it's not something um, that we would em employ during a uh, purple team exercise. So, 
The second question is, when is the last time you've had to fall back on reverse engineering as a last resort to some of the attacks that you faced? Oh, actually, just a couple of months ago. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I'm not going to take the credit for this. Um, one of our penetration testers, um, he just could not get access to this particular box that he wanted. Um, so what he did, he basically reverse engineered um, a piece of malware and he made it appear benign, as in, not benign, but he made it undetectable via um, the AV that they had in, in place and uh, successfully deployed it. He also used PowerShell instead of a tool. So I think something to really um, hone in on is, so, so I hope that answers your question, Brendan. Um, so the last time I've come across, I, mean, I, I didn't do it. I, if I tried to re reverse engineer anything other than a piece of cake, I would be shit at it. I'm not very good at reverse engineering. Um, so uh, yes, one of our pen one of our pen testers, and I'm usually the purple team um, lead, but I I have a pen tester that works with me, um, and he did really well in reverse engineering a piece of piece of malware to change it enough to manage to deploy it onto the environment. But something I really want to hone in on is how important it is to. Um, emphasize living off the land so um rather than concentrating on specific tools and how you can deploy them into environment and how you can exploit things with those tools i think it's really better to understand how those tools work and if you understand how they work you can substitute those tools for visual basics or um uh powershell for example or a bash script and and that's again something that um is really really beneficial from a red team perspective. Brandon's got another question. Using the ERM eliminate to reduce mitigate process, the, what is one of the most damaging attacks you've had to deal with? If you solved the attack, how exactly did you deal with the threat using the ERM process by mitigating, reducing or eliminating the threat? Oh, well, that's a really good question. So. I mean, this goes back to before I had a business. Um, I don't think I don't know if, what how I can't go into too much depth about this because I did sign a document that says I'm not allowed. However, um, there was a company that was a supplier for critical national infrastructure here in the UK, and um, they used Team Viewer. And if any of you have looked at the security implications of using team viewer there's the common sense thing of um you can drag and drop anything onto whatever you're connected to but also there was a nation state from china that were using um team viewer to attack um third party suppliers to our government and i was involved in one of those investigations which was actually fascinating um but i can't go into too much detail about who they were and what what the actual process was but that was by far the most fascinating and um, actually stepping away from the defense process, what we actually did was studied what they were doing um, because we knew that that third party wasn't particularly um, a dangerous target and who they were supplying to wouldn't have killed anyone. It wouldn't have had a major effect. So it, would, it was actually beneficial nationally to study what they were doing before eradicating it from the environment and then what we had to do was essentially rebuild their entire environment you can't trust a single machine once something like that's happened once you've had a compromise of that scale um so so yeah it was it was no longer a matter of just removing team viewer um it was more a matter of um you know wiping the systems. I won't go into too much more detail than that. Um, another question I from Rick. Sorry. Another question from uh, Ricky is that we often find that in a somewhat cliche way, when an infosec department does a very good job, it looks to other departments and upper management that aren't actually doing anything. 
there hasn't been a large scale successful attack or incident. How would you convince those in charge of finance, finance tra tra training um, resources to keep on investing in, in, your, in your security team? I'm so sorry, Andy. Sorry. Is there any chance you could say that again? Because I. Of course, not a problem. Yeah, a couple of glasses of wine, and I'm just not absorbing the information. No Go worries. Ahead. No worries. I'll I'll, I'll 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 read it again. Uh, so let's see. Um, Thank you, love. No worries. Let's see. Um, dun, 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 Take dun, your dun. time. I am. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We often find that in a somewhat cliche way, when an infosec department does a very good job. It looks to other departments and upper management, but they aren't actually doing anything because there hasn't been a large scale successful attack or incident. How would you convince those in charge of financing slash training resources to keep on investing in your cybersecurity team? Oh yeah, that's, I think that's really interesting and it's a really good cultural question. Um, so, okay. so. What I'm thinking this is asking is about how um, a lot of the time um, a security team uses a lot of resources from um, various other areas within a business and how can you convince anybody <laughs> that that, is, that means success and that means money well spent. Um, I think the best way to to speak to people that are in a position of authority in a business and especially those that are on C level is to really discuss the finances and that's so boring and I I don't want to discuss finances that's fine but unless it's like money in my bank I don't give a shit <laughs> <laughs> um but that is definitely the way the way to communicate so unfortunately chief information security officers um heads of it and um, chief technical officers are held to account based on budgetary requirements so um if you can say okay hear me out here this wasn't a successful attack but i know we used like 10 hours of sysadmin time and i know we used like five hours of this this developer's time and this DBA we use like lo like loads of his time and he had to like cross reference all like ah, like I know. However, that accounts to forty grand. That's a lot of money. And I'm you know. However, if you'd have been attacked and it would have been successful and this was real, this was actually what we thought it was. And we thought it was a data leak that had been pasted on Pastebin, then you would have been fined like five percent of your annual revenue. So you would have been fined twenty million pounds. So see this as a training exercise. See this as something that we did um, to stop you from getting fined that money. You're welcome. And that's what I do. But I'm a cheeky bitch. So there you go. Sorry for swearing. <laughs> I'm not sorry, I don't care. <laughs> well, there's no there's, there's no under sixteen, so we don't need to worry about that. Oh well, there you go then. <laughs> so next question from Brandon: How would you advise SMEs to manage their finances around security and other departments during the coronavirus pandemic? Would you oh, suggest? Uh, sorry, relevant question, Brandon. That's really good. Um. I suppose it depends what um, what industry you're in. Um, really, let's say that you're in SME and you're in um, you're in e-commerce, like we mentioned earlier. As long as your um, website is protected, as long as you're using, say, Sage Pay or something to handle the payments, and your web server is defended, and you've got relatively um, robust but maybe basic um, configurations deployed within your environment i think you're all right i mean i don't want to don't sue me if you're not um but i don't think you need to be going out and like buying like you know dark place and minecast and all these like crazy big expensive tools um concentrate on what's applicable to you and if what's applicable to you and what is the most important thing to you is keeping that web server up and that website up um and those transactions happening as long as that 
process is protected that's the main thing don't get carried away with all the other things you think you should do or what everyone else is doing and I think like with manufacturing a lot of manufacturing environments uh, and, and like industrial control system and SCADA environments they get really carried away like they, they'll hire like a cyber security person and that cyber security person comes from an environment um, where they've had to concentrate on data and they're like yes the, the data security is the most important thing and blah, blah, blah. Um, and actually, like, in a, and don't sue me for saying this, but in an ICS SCADA environment, it's kind of not the most important thing. So if the data that you've got in your systems is, um, I don't know, the, the fucking recipe for a particular type of polymer, who cares? If that recipe is open source and everyone's using that same kind of plastic building methodology, who cares? Now, what does matter in that environment is keeping that system, that machine active and pumping out that plastic product whether it's a spoon or a, um, a ear cleaner or makeup brush or whatever that's the priority there so concentrate on the priority and apply the native security principles to that and best security principles so i would suggest if you're sort of really stuck for where to start if you just google um, the industry that you're in and then NIST, N-I-S-T, you most likely will come across something quite useful. So if you Google like um, manufacturing NIST, you'll probably come across industrial control system NIST and it will be like all best practices um, aligned to the, uh, the NIST principles. So, you know, if you've got um, windows in your environment, if you go to Microsoft and go Microsoft best practices and, um, you know, turn everything on, you know, SMEs 99.9% .9 of the time, unless they're supplying to um, the government or critical national infrastructure, NHS, whatever like that, are not going to be like massively um, targeted. Um, however, if you are, you, probably, you know, if you are supplying to the NHS in you know, a critical national infrastructure and government, you are probably going to be targeted, let's face it. But other than that, you're probably not going to be targeted. So as long as you're covering the low hanging fruit, I think you'll be all right. And if people say to you, you need to buy next generation this and this thing, you plug and play and ignore them, they're talking crap. All right. Thank you. Um, OK. Another question we have is, what is a project ma management, this is from Brandon again, what is a project uh, management methodology hi, Brandon. Co so commonly used by your organisation to work on security products and why, um, what made it the uh, most uh, obvious choice to use? That's an excellent question and I actually don't have an answer for that, Brendan. So, um, although... Um, Although I and my business partner and various other people in our company have worked on different projects and have aligned themselves to different project management principles, um, we don't, there's not one in particular that we use because it may change depending on where we go. So it varies. Um, so we just it on our own method of sort of keeping track in the methods that we keep track. And that's what's most important to us really at the moment. But I mean, that's something to think about. And it's a good question. So I'm guessing it varies because it's the best way to uh, change things up. So things won't always be the same all the time, will they, for all the projects? No, exactly. And you're, you're absolutely right in, in saying that. I, and I, I were half expecting you to uh, say PRINCE2 because that is usually the most commonly used um, project management methodology that's uh, used by organisations, but it's always nice to have a bit of variety in there because you, Prince 2 doesn't, it doesn't really work for everything like you need it to. No, I think you're right. I think you're very right there. Um, so we actually looked at Prince 2 um, when we were developing our methodology and there was just so many um, deviations from it. Um, and so many different variables that we thought this isn't going to work for us. Um, and there was something else, I can't remember the name of it, um, that we looked at. And in the end, we just thought, you know what, we'll just develop our own methodology. 
we'll align ourselves to that and see how it works and so far it's worked well so we've just stayed with what we've developed ourselves um and maybe when we get bigger maybe when we're a bigger company we may have to um employ something that's more standardized um and in, in that case you know maybe we will and if you have any recommendations that'd be awesome if you could put it in the chat does anyone have any um any any, any uh, other any any uh, more questions for eliza tall um, i think i've bored everyone to sleep would would you mind if i asked a few questions please of course i don't mind go ahead cool awesome so you mentioned about the automation of some of the uh, different 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 um tests which you do what kind of tools would you use to uh, to, to to you know to sort of automate some of the ta tasks and sort of like how long would it how long would it take to automate them just out of curiosity no, it's a good question. So in terms of automation of um, cyber defense, a lot of that involves um, implementing rule sets within your theme solution or within your um, network controls. So um, for example, um, IDS solutions, putting a rule set in place, <laughs> excuse me, putting a rule set in place um, that says, you know, if this particular machine exhibits this behavior, so let's give an example of command and control. So if a machine beacons out every two seconds or every 30 seconds or in just quick succession of one another, and it goes to a domain or an IP address, it's not internal. And it happens every two seconds, every 10 seconds, or every 30 seconds, block it or alert on it. So that's the kind of automation that I mean. Cool. So, uh, you know, we may think that that's quite common sense, but in a lot of places that's not implemented. And I mean, that's a shame. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times you can see a piece of, something will be downloaded and it won't trigger anything because we're in and of itself, it's benign, but that will call out to a domain or an, I an IP address of some sort, even sometimes a website that's been compromised and it will then say, I'm here, I've executed, I've got through the security controls that are there, I wanna now download you, part number two. And it will download the second piece of code and together they are malicious, whereas individually they're quite benign. So they manage to infiltrate the environment because of their benign status, but together they can work together and act as a piece of malware. So things like that, you can study the behavior and um, employ that into your use cases in your Steam product or in your industrial, con um, in your um, IDS and IPS um, prevention systems, sorry. Thank you. Next question I've got is, with the tests which you do automated wise and with sort of like tests which you do sort of like you know, preparing sort of like manual wise and, and stuff like that yeah. to a penetration test. Do you have a sort of like a a kind of a ratio of how of what kind of tests you do, for example, like so many percentages uh, automated or or sort of like you you sort of do sort of like manually, um, but sort of like prepare a lot of it just out just out of curiosity. Good question. So. Um... No, I mean, the majority of what we do, like 90% of what we do, um, the most of what we do actually is manual. Um, and the remediations and the mitigations that we put in place, um, we make sure that that defense mechanism is automated because that's what we're emphasizing our, our project on. Um, but no, a lot of the time we are looking so, so specifically at what an attacker is doing that we have to almost um put someone with a human brain on that topic mm -hmm. if that makes any sense yeah um yeah how how also do you say yourself and that security company evolving evolving you know over next over the next sort of five ten years as um threats will get you know more and more 
more more sophisticated and more more advanced. You just have to keep studying them. You yeah. just have to keep up to date, and you have to keep studying yeah. them, and you have to keep testing the processes that they do and making sure that you can repeat them and making sure that your penetration testers are up to date with the latest information and um you know sort of using um test beds for example creating virtual networks and exploring what what is what is the trend at the moment and can you keep up to date with it and if you can't why not and um a lot of that is almost cultural and making sure that the people that you've got um, the offensive security professionals that you've got are adequately trained in order to keep up. Cool. And also, if anyone wants to know how to keep up, if you if you look at the Mighty Attack Framework and you look at um, CISP, um, which is, uh, I think it's NCSD that runs CISP, that's a forum that you can apply to be on. And nine times out of 10, if you're a legitimate company, you will get access and you can keep up to date relatively quickly. I know I've been on um, things like Bash Bunny. Um, I think it was Bad Bunny when that was on. Um, like attacks that have happened as they're happening and you get information from the government on CISP. So I would advise anyone here to sign up to that if you're working in the security profession. And now my final question. So you've inspired a lot of people in, in cybersecurity and pen testing. Don't be modest. What, um, what inspired you to first develop a you know, career in cybersecurity? Oh, God. Um... No, no, don't be sorry. Jesus, it's just a question. It's fine. Um, okay, so there's a number of things. So um, when I was a, a midget, I mean, I'm still a midget, I'm five foot one, but when I was like a tiny human child person, I watched a film called The Net. If any of you have seen The Net, it's got Sandra Bullock in it, it's an awesome film. It was way ahead of its time and it didn't do very well in the cinema. I think it went straight to VHS. Because um, everyone was like, who, who cares about this, like, cyber shit? Um, so basically, Sandra Bullock played the part of this malware reverse engineer um, or programmer, I can't remember. Um, but if any of you are listening to this and you're, like, nodding away, Mary's heart goes, uh, anyway, whatever. Um, so, yeah, awesome. And I remember watching her order a pizza online while talking to strangers online. And I was like, oh, my God, like, I need this i need to do this um and yes and then i didn't and i went and became a waitress and various other things um however later on i went to university to do um forensics and i didn't like it i was shit at it, it a lot of it invo involved physics and advanced mathematics and i was like no no that's not happening i'm not doing that that's terrible i can't do it i'm shit um so I literally Googled forensics in the north and it came up with Sheffield Hallam University's digital forensics degree. And I thought, Meh, I'll transition on to that. There's no jobs in actual like, you know, forensics, like people getting murdered. Um, so, so I went and did that and I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Shaz. And uh, yeah, not looked back since. That was it. That's, that's my story, essentially. Cool. So, th does anyone have any more questions for Eliza or, or should I wrap up now? I think everyone's sick of hearing from me. Maybe not. But I'm going to say, everybody, I'd like to personally thank everyone for attending and I'd like to thank all the committee for, for help, for, help, for um, everything that they do as well. I'd like to thank Eliza. Thank you for delivering such a fantastic talk. Everybody give Eliza oh, a hand. Oh, thanks for having me. No, our, ple our pleasure. I mean, I mean, you're always, you're always welcome to do another talk again. So, um, yeah, it's a pleasure. Our next event is going to be on, on the uh, 20... No, sorry. Get the date right. 19th of November. I believe it's going to be a talk about robotics. So it's going to be around about half six but more details will appear on the south yorkshire bcs website sy.bcs.org 
Um, it'll also be on LinkedIn as well. So our talks on, are going to be online until further notice. Um, but once you have the face-to-face -face events again, we I shall also let you all know as well. So I'm going to stop recording now.